Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we delve again into Judges 11, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may have the wisdom that we're going to need to rightly divide the word of truth? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word, to study your word, and to seek to learn what it truly means to rightly divide the word of truth. I ask your blessing upon each one that are attending these meetings and those that will view this on the internet. <clears throat> Please help us today, Father. Give us strength. May your spirit attend us so that we may have the wisdom that we need as we search out the meaning of the symbols on which we will be reading. May your angels attend us, help us so that we may breathe in the atmosphere of heaven as we are addressing these topics. Help us to learn so that we may be better prepared, so that we may more clearly understand that which you would have us to know. For this we ask, for this we pray, and this we thank you. Now and always in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, now yesterday, we left off in the latter part of Judges 11. To do a quick recap, we have that Jephthah is recounting the travels of the children of Israel. And he is recounting to those that have come against Israel the blessings that God has given them. We had covered that they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabbok and from the wilderness under the Jordan. <clears throat> now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Wilt thou possess that which Chemosh thy God has given thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them we will we possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of the Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt, dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aurora and her towns, and in all the cities that be along the coast of Arnon, 300 years. Why, therefore, did ye not recover them within that time? So the, the question is being posed, what's taken you so long? Why haven't you been able to do what Balak was unable to do? Yeah. Yeah, so... The way I understand this, and um, so he's appealing to the king of Moab. Is uh, it to the king, king of Edom? King of Edom, pardon me. Thank you. And um, so he's appealing to the king of Edom, and he's going over the history of of the land, right? So about dealing with how they when they came in originally and had possessed this part of which is the land east of the jordan and how that no one had um 
fought against Israel, that Israel claimed this land. And then he's going to bring up Balak, which, of course, that's why we went to the story of Balaam, because that's what's being referenced here. And that, you know, Balak was not able to defeat Israel. Um, he tried to curse Israel, right, through Balaam. Um, so, so the idea here then is nobody stood against us before, but now 300 years later, um, you're trying to claim this land, but you're not going to be able to. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly why he gives this message to the king of Edom. Um, oh, the king of Ammon? Uh, or the king of Ammon, right? Right. Yeah, the king of Ammon, right. So why does he give this message to <clears> him? <throat> What's the purpose of it? Okay, yes, yeah, so it's the, yeah, the king of Ammon. So let me see here. Yeah, the king of the children of Ammon. So they send these messages So, okay. Because yeah. they're going to be coming to fight against against them. So why are you doing this now? Is that basically what he's asking? Is that, no. Right. Isn't he recounting the past history to remind the, the king of the Ammonites that God has led us and we have our faith that he will continue to lead us yeah and we've had this, and we've had this for 300 years and can you stand against what he's already done yeah well why does why does he do this isn't this a merciful way of saying you have no hope maybe okay and then the king of Ammon, right? He's going to, <coughs> and you took away my land when you came, when, you know, that Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt. Um, and what he's, he's, yeah. What, what he's doing here when he proceeds in verse 27, wherefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the, and the children of Ammon. I didn't go into your lands. I didn't fight with you. I didn't oppose you. But now you're coming to oppose me. Yeah. Um, it's basically what's happening. But I'm just trying to understand this in more detail. So, so let's go back because I, I want to get this clear in my mind. <laughs> he sends the message to the king of Ammon. Okay. King of Ammon, and and then he then the king of Ammon says, um, you know, you took this land away from us, right? Right. And then he's going to say, um, we did not take away the land. We took not away the land of Moab, nor of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel <coughs> sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through. So they had wanted to just be able to pass through the land, but they would not let them pass through, and also with the king of Moab. So then he says, um, then they went along through the wilderness, compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was in the border of Moab. And Israel sent the messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon, and Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee. So the same thing is going to happen with the Amorites, but Sion does not let them pass. And so... Uh, the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the land of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed all the coast of the Amorites from Arnon, 
even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness, even unto the Jordan. Um, so now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, then we will possess. So God has done this, right? Right. And that's where he brings up, and now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Because he never struck, struck, uh, stro stro strove against Israel, right? Right. Never fought against them. <clears throat> tried to curse them. Well, Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and Aurora and her towns, and all in all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon, three hundred years. So if it's for three hundred years, we've had this territory, um, but you didn't come in to recover it within that time. So he says, "I've not done anything wrong, basically, and you are doing wrong to me by warring against me." And that the Lord will judge, right? So this day, so this is going to be this battle. Um, now we need to understand these as messages, then, right? Right. So where would we put this message? Where where would this message have been fulfilled in our history, or is it future? Wouldn't this be, again, another aspect of the July, of the July 18th message? And the, this being the message to the church? Okay, how would, how would it be the message to the church? The church hasn't wanted to publicize Mrs. White's warning about the destruction coming on Nashville. They didn't want this out in the world. They wanted it kept quiet. Hmm. Okay. Um, you'd have to explain though how <clears throat> this is this well, is the message of July 18th, which we agree upon that the message of Jephthah is a message that Jeff's movement invited back in. Right? The FFA invited this message back in after having rejected it. That's the premise I'm beginning with. So I'm not sure what it would have to do with the church. Hasn't the church attacked those in the movement for publicizing the message of the destruction coming on Nashville? Okay. Okay. So, so if we're giving this message to To the king of the Ammon, Am, king of a, the children of Ammon. What does the king of the children of Ammon represent? You're saying that's the church? Yes, I'm asking that question. Okay. Anybody got thoughts on that? I, see, I would put this more as the United States, but. Because that's because I don't think that we gave the message of July 18th to the <clears throat> Seventh Adventist Church. We gave it to the United States. Okay, <clears throat> but we gave it not just to the United States. We gave it to the world. Yeah, to the world as well. But it was it was given to Nashville specifically, and because of the Tennessee and and the negative response, it ended up going to the world. But it is primarily was a message to the United States about uh, the papacy. It was warning them of the papacy was part of it. If you look at Jeff, Jeff's ad. Hmm. Well. I'm looking at this as as a 
kind of a hand in hand situation. There had to be a warning given to the United States. There was also to be a warning given to the church itself. Because we're, we're either going to accept everything that Mrs. White has written mm-hmm. and live accordingly, or we are going to attempt to set aside things that she's written <clears throat> and do very much like many of the leaders of the church have done and say that she's written this specifically for her time and it has no nothing of importance to offer us today mm-hmm. now by using this with the children of the ammonites <clears throat> we know that this that the children of ammon were a relation to the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. And I think that by the application of this being a message, a message is being given to the church. So I'm just, I'm, I'm placing it in that in that way for purposes of discussion. Yeah. Okay. So they're de- descended from from Lot through Ben Ami. Right. He's the son of my people. <clears throat> so. Okay. But then we come to this, this next verse. How be it the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent them. Yeah. So, so we could say this about the July 18, 2020 prediction. Right. Um, it was whoever the king of the children of Ammon is, whatever that symbolizes, um, it ends up being rejected. That message is rejected. Okay. Um, yeah, I still would think that this primarily refers to the message given to the U.S. Because if if we look at the message that Ellen White gave about Nashville, what was that message? Who was it for? Was it not a warning to Nashville itself and to those in the South? Okay. And, and what was the warning specifically tied to? Why did Ellen White give that warning? Why was she so concerned? You know, it was obviously God gave her the vision, but why, why is this focus upon Nashville? Because they had chosen to begin to build this temple, this idolatrous temple within Nashville. And what did that temple symbolize for those that built it? I remember the point being that it was built by somebody that had been in rebellion. So, yeah. So it had to do with the Athens of the South, the idea right. that they the Athens of the South. Right. So, what was the issue about the South as opposed to the North? <clears throat> well, here again the party that chose to attempt to build this as the Athens of the South wanted to honor the Greek educational system, but wanted to honor the Greek culture more than anything else. And therefore chose to build this temple. Yeah. And so, so they were doing this Greek educational system in the South because they believed that they were superior to the North and that that was a symbol the fact that they were the athens of the south and they had all these educational institutions they were trying to make the south cultured in a greek sense um 
and also in their which which was connected to their belief regarding uh, slavery. They believed that they were wronged in um, what happened in the Civil War. So it is partly a response to the Civil War as well. Okay. Right. So. So the idea that it's the South, it's still opposed to the North and the ideas of the North. Correct. Yeah. Now, now we know one of the things about the, the Civil War and about Democrats. Democrats definitely historically supported slavery. And why was that? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it probably had to do with power of political parties and where they saw their power coming from, their support. But their their entire culture <clears throat> south of the Mason Dixon line mm -hmm. had been built upon the labor of those that they saw to be inferior. Right. The cotton plantations primarily. So <clears throat> Whether you were dealing with cotton or tobacco yeah. or any of the other situations that you would find south of the Mason Dixon line, this was an area that believed that they had the right to enslave other people. The men were only good as laborers, the women were only, were only good for bearing children. Now, their entire economy was built upon, rather than working for the for a gain as God would see it, theirs was to obtain their wages from the labors of others. <clears throat> now, what's so different about what the Democrats want right now? Nothing. So at this point, when they're making accusations of that one party wants to take away, quote, social security, one party wants to change this or change this, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, this is what we want, but we want to accuse the other people of doing it. <clears throat> now, here we have a situation. Jephthah is saying to the king of Ammon and to his people that you're wanting to come to battle with me, with my people, when we have done you no harm. So he's laying out and reminding Jephthah, this is what God has done in the past. Do you think that God's going to change just because you, you were part of the same family? <clears throat> okay, so... Um... So we have an, another symbol here, which is the 300 years. Okay. What, what is that symbol? I don't have a direct answer. Okay, well, we know 300 it, uh, connects us to the story of uh, Gideon. Right. Okay. 
and we have applied the story of Gideon uh, to this message of July 18th, correct? Agreed. Okay. And and if you talk about 300 years instead of 300 people, I mean, this gives us time, right, as a symbol. All right. So time is being used as a symbol here. 300 years. Um and that's and that's basically the July 18, 2020 prediction was based upon an understanding of chronology. So could that 300 years represent um, the message of of Gideon, July 18th, as as that symbol? Would that be another symbol we would attach to it, or is there some other way we should understand that? <clears throat> Because 300 years is is this period of time. It's, it's, it's a reference to time. And here, this is going to be the time that, that they had possessed uh, this land east of the Jordan. But this is the message of, of Jephthah of July 18. And we already attached, as we said, Gideon to this message. And, and the message of Gideon, of course, is the message of the seven times. Um, but we connected it to July 18th in a number of ways, which I can't think of all of them right now. But Jeff had connected the story of Gideon. We know that it's going to be about the Sunday law as well, right? Game. Right. So, so the message of July 18th is connected <clears throat> to the Sunday law in our, in our line. And we know that the Sunday law, the typical Sunday law, happens between November 9th and July 18th, the pandemic. So if we're going to try to understand this message, who it's given to, um, I still think we would have to say that it was the message given to Nashville. But that's that's what the the message of Jephthah is about, and and I think it's important in understanding that because when we look at Jephthah's tragic vow, if we don't if we don't understand what this message is, then the vow isn't going to make sense. I know. Does anybody have thoughts about this? I... Well, there there was one comment in the chat to step back for a second, and then let's. Let's okay. go through this in more depth. The comment from the chat was that the papacy gives permission to its adherents to murder and to enslave. As in doctrine of discovery and crimen's solicitans, and there, that could be a misspelling, the ancient Greeks believed in elitism and slavery as well. So... When we're, when we're dealing with this right now, when you're dealing with these elites, you are taking, and this, this has become, again, a very popular word to be thrown around, a very fascist attitude. Because <clears throat> during the Third Reich, those that were in power believed that they were superior in all ways to many of the rest of the population. And they were so superior, they could decide who should live and who should die. Mm -hmm. That's not much different than what we saw in the time of the Greeks, because the Greek Empire was was very much unlike the Medes and the Persians because the Medes and the Persians were primarily a rule of law. The Greeks were more 
of an elitist society. You must train and be schooled as we have trained and we have been schooled. <clears throat> For we are wiser than you. We are better than you in many ways. Yeah. Now. Okay. Well, okay, just to, okay, if you have your point, finish it. Go point. ahead, finish. Well, it's just going back to the point where Ellen White's talking about the destruction of Nashville. This is when they're working in the South, uh, particularly her son, um, uh, what's her son's name, who's working in the South? Um, Edson, right? Right. I remember. So Ed's, Edson, Edson <clears throat> White, right? So you got, right? Edson, her son Edson. Okay, yes. Right, so he's working in the South, he's working in Nashville. Um, and there, there is opposition from the church leaders regarding this, right? How they're going to work in the South. Ellen White actually ended up redirecting uh, other people's tithe money to help in the work in the South. And how did the church treat them? Well, I don't know. They definitely weren't happy about it. Yeah, I agreed. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I don't know what they particularly tried to do about it, but... Um, uh, and remember when we look at the one, because we were looking at this map, and she also has that map in uh, um, uh, in the in the study that we did on um, righteousness by faith, basically the history of the first and second angels' messages. Um, so there is there is these plans or this map of of what's being done. So man's plans are going to be destroyed. Okay. So, I mean, the question is, okay, I'm, I'm sort of trying to not give how I'm thinking too much because um, I want people to sort of figure it out. But um, so when we look at the pandemic, why did the pandemic come? at the time that we were giving the July 18, 2020 prediction. Did we ever think that was odd? Well, partly to divert our minds from it, from, from July 18th, rather. Okay. I don't, I don't know if it did. I mean, July 18th came, you know, pretty soon after the the pandemic uh, issues started in the United States, because that would have been in basically in at the end of March or in March that we started to get these restrictions happening. Um, but people weren't really fully caught up in the pandemic yet. Hadn't really... Um, hit anybody because nobody really knew anybody who had been sick and you know it's before the vaccine mandates you know trump's still in power at that time in july 18 2020. i mean we did take it as evidence that we might be correct about july 18 2020 in that jeff had made the prediction of the pandemic and it came at the right time So can we connect this, what happens in 2020, with what's happening in Ellen White's day when she gives the Nashville prediction? <clears throat> so you're saying that there was something else that was going on at that time that would divert the church from accepting what she what she gave as the Nashville projection. Um, I, well, I don't know. All I know is that when she gives this prediction, it's dealing with slavery. Now, what do we have happening in in twenty twenty? 
that's we have the pandemic, but what also is happening? The elitists are be, are beginning to show their hand. Okay, what about the BLM riots? Have, have we placed those at all in connection with our message? Not at all. Okay. But wouldn't that have to be prophetic? Wouldn't that have to be connected with Nashville? With the Nashville prediction? Because here we have the July 18, 2020 prediction. We have the pandemic that was predicted. And then we have the BLM riots. And all of these things are happening at that time in 2020. I would almost have to ask if the BLM riots were not another distraction. One thing the BLM riots and the Antifa riots did was to help the real estate people who wanted to take over and uh, what's the expression, they gentrify certain areas. After, the, after they had done their damage there, they were able to go in and build as they chose these rich corporations. And Catherine Austin Fitz brings that out a lot better than I can. But who is actually behind some of these rich corporations? Satan, the elite. I'm saying that you've got the banks first. The banksters, of course. Because if the banks are controlling the property, the banks can make the decision as to who's going where. And what was the one thing that the founding fathers of America decried the most? Banks and their power. That's why they didn't want a national bank. Yeah. <laughs> See, I think we can get a little bit sidetracked in looking at what appear to be motivations. I'm not so concerned about these types of motivations as much as what these represent symbolically. Okay. How do you see BLM being represented symbolically? Okay. So, well, we know what, what's happening. We know what happens in the Civil War in, in the 1860s, right? So we know that that's a prof prophetic event and that Ellen White is um, talking about the judgments that are going to come upon the United States because of racism, because of how, because of slavery specifically. And we're going to have the South, because she's going to give these uh, three prophecies, she's given three visions regarding the Civil War. Um, and and what's happening with, with the South and also with the North, because the North is, is not um, innocent. No, so no, the North is definitely not innocent. Yeah, right. Where, you know, often people just think, well, the North was against slavery and the South was all about slaves. Um, and, and just getting back to if, if we want to look at how slavery ended in the United States, it was primarily economic. That is, as you noted, the South was dependent upon slave labor. In the North, they weren't. At least not directly. Because right. what had happened is um, before, when you transported black people um, to America, that was economically uh, beneficial at first. But later on, they found it was actually much more beneficial to leave the slaves where they were and get them to produce goods cheaply 
rather than to transport the people. That was actually a lot more expensive. And so, you know, we've had the end of slavery in North America to a large degree. But that slavery has just been trans, uh, you know, it's just they transport the goods rather than the people. So we still really have a society that's highly dependent upon slave labor, even today. Right, people who are laboring in, in squalor and terrible conditions. And yet we benefit from those, that labor, right? Um, but anyway, if we, if we get back to what, what Ellen White's talking about, there was this um, uh, fast that was supposed to happen in, in the north that uh, Lincoln called for. And Ellen White said that the, the Adventists could not support that fast because it was hypocritical of the North in what they were doing. They were wanting to win this war, but really they had to end slavery, which is what they eventually did. Um, so anyway, getting back, trying to look at this, we have this civil war that's happening. So if we remember in, in 2018, Heidi and I started studying this civil war, Ellen White's visions, and uh, we recognize that there was a parallel to our history. Now, most of what was picked up on by FFA was that we were uh, predicting something to happen on November 22nd. But that was actually not the main reason of our study. That was just a, a little detail that came out of our study of the Civil War. Uh, but that was what was picked up on. We had made this prediction. And, and again, we made the prediction. Uh, we believe it was given up to us to see whether we could predict events. We weren't trying to predict an event. And um, so that all got shut down by FFA. We ended up getting uh, ultimately kicked out of the School of the Prophets. Um, for lots of different reasons that they had, but we, that we never really understood. But anyway, um, then we're going to be invited back with this message of July 18th. So July 18th was, was part of this. They were all connected, in my mind. Everything that we were doing was connected. So now we have this message. We have... I mean, we definitely have to say what's happening with the BLM riots is a civil war in the United States. Would, would people agree with that? Yes. I could see it as a possible um, beginning of a civil war. Right. It's, it's a beginning. Um, so we know that Civil wars don't just all of a sudden happen. I mean, there there's steps that uh, continue to advance to get to what we call a full blown civil war. And of course, in America, you you have the the civil war of the 1860s, which is how most people think civil wars are fought. Um, but they're not always fought that way. That you end up with two separate governments in half the countries fighting against the other half of the country. But usually they, it, it, they occur within a country. Um, they can happen all different kinds of ways. But the American Civil War is not a typical civil war. Consider this. Just before the Civil War and its complete, before it really burst upon the country, who was the president? of the United States at that time? Before the Civil War? Yes. I don't know. I don't know my American history. Okay. The person that was the president before the outbreak of the full Civil War was named James Buchanan. Okay, I've heard that name. He was a Democrat. He was also our only unmarried president. 
Now, <clears throat> James Buchanan. Currently, we have an initials of J.B. Who is the current president of the United States? Um, president Brandon. Joseph Robinette <laughs> Biden. <laughs> J.B. Yeah, yeah, Joe Biden. So we have two JBs at this point. Okay. Now, James Buchanan did not wish to do anything that was going to upset the South. He was one that His attitude was very much, time will tell. At this point, <clears throat> President Brandon is one that when, <clears throat> when he's asked a direct question without a teleprompter, he backpedals, but in front of a teleprompter, he gives these speeches that are fomenting hatred. Yeah, yeah, so they're definitely promoting uh, a civil war. So at this point, President Brandon is doing the work that James Buchanan did not wish to do. Okay, so it's sort of reverse. Correct. Near. Now, James Buchanan was president <clears throat> from 1856 to 1860. He served only four years. He was not ever seen as being a strong president. He was seen as being a placeholder. So at this point, with everything else that's going on in this country, we have a party that to begin with, didn't see that he was going to be president for much more than four years, that he was going to be a transitional president. Mentally, I don't think he has the acumen to be able to govern even for another year. Okay, yeah. but we are right now on the verge of a civil war that is not just between blacks, or excuse me, between whites over the blacks. Because, I mean, honestly, skin color means nothing. What we are right now looking at is we have others that view themselves superior to every other person in the world and they wish to make the United States their battleground. Mm -hmm. So these elitists, they want control. I mean, the, the ultimate thing that I believe you would find with Bill Gates, George Soros, Klaus whatever Klaus's last name is. Schwab. 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 Yeah. They believe the world is overpopulated and that we need to reduce the population of the world so that it's a better place for those that are quote unquote so superior. But here again, albeit the king of the children of Ammon, hearken not unto the words of Jephthah when he sent them. We have many today that will not hearken to the word of God. 
they don't want to hearken to the word of God. Can we I ask many... a question? Yes, please. Uh, who comes after this James Buchanan? Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, another question. Do you think Donald Trump knew about the July 18, 2020 prediction? I think it's possible. It's definitely I possible. I think he probably did because Ben Carson might have told him. Well, no, it wouldn't have been Ben Carson who would have told him. Ben Carson wouldn't have known about it. Uh, the Adventists didn't know about it till the Tennessee and uh, till the world knew about it. But the the American Secret Service or military, whatever you want to call it, they knew about it long before that. The the intelligence groups. Mm -hmm. I think that they they had an understanding. And let's remember that about the same time that Future for America mm -hmm. was being very direct about the Nashville prediction, all of a sudden you have Don Frost and Steve Wolberg wanting to address this, but they didn't really want to address it so that it would go forward to the world. They went down and they began talking about this in Nashville, you know, that this was going to happen, but they did not wish to publicize this and make it a major point. Yeah, so we know the intelligence community, um, they were they were aware of, of FFA, right? Right. They got called to one of our camp meetings, I'm not sure which one. Um, was that in 2019? I don't recall. I think it was. Because um, that, I, I think, because I'd heard about it uh, around that time. So uh, there was somebody who was making some claims and uh, I don't remember all the details um, but there was uh, concerns about somebody with mental illness that was connected but anyway as far as the intelligent community they keep an eye on everything um, um, when I was in the self-supporting work in British Columbia we had two different uh, people from the intelligent community at our um, institution uh, happened to be there at the same time from two different organizations um, and uh, so you know the intelligent community intelligence community is watching everything now something like an attack on Nashville you would think that the president would be informed about that type of information. <clears throat> Especially considering the details and the people involved um, who were connected to the intelligence community in this in this movement who were uh, connected to it in the past. I thought Jeff wrote Donald Trump a letter for the, yeah. White, for, the White, for the White House. Yeah, I don't know if he would necessarily get that, but I, I never heard about that. So anyway, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is I think we're missing a lot of details regarding our July 18th, 2020 prediction that we need to take into account the BML, BLM riots, right? We need to take into account that there is this pandemic at the same time and also that we have um, uh, this prediction, this publication that's going to happen. So uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. That's fine. I know we're, we're kind of taking a 
a long roundabout way to address these points here. But uh, just to remind people about Ellen White's Civil War visions, so there's three of them. The January 12, 1861 vision, which is 90 days before the Civil War begins. And, and the Civil War is going to commence on the first day of the first month on the biblical calendar, April 12, 1861. And 100 days later is going to be her, uh, be the event that she's going to have a vision about. And that event is the Battle of Manassas, also called the First Battle of Bull Run. And that's July 21st. And that symbol is the symbol of midnight. And then we're going, right? And then we're going to have 13 days and 13 or 13 days is how many minutes? One thousand eight hundred seven hundred and twenty. Thank you, Aram. Yeah, eighteen thousand seven hundred and twenty minutes. And then she's going to have a vision about the Battle of Manassas, right? So that's going to be on August 3rd, 1861. And she's going to show that God intervened in that battle. And then we're going to have 22 weeks, 154 days, the same number of days between Samuel Snow's first letter when it's written and when it's, when it's finally uh, published. It's 22 weeks, right? And that's going to be her third vision, January 4th, 1862. So, so there's a lot more stuff at the end there. But one thing we can see is that this civil war is connected and her visions are connected to the symbols that we have in our line. The first day of the first month. The fifth day of the fourth month. Well, in this case, it's going to be July 21st, but a different, uh, different type of month. And then we have the 13 days, which is a symbol of July 18, 2020. And then we have the 22 weeks, Samuel Snow's letters. So, and and this is being found out in 2018. This is when I made this. Uh, did this presentation. Um, so, so we have this message. We have the message about the Civil War. We have the message about uh, the pandemic. We have the message that addresses Islam in our lines. And all of these things then have to be considered if we're going to understand that this is the message of Jephthah. So it, it encompasses more than July 18th itself. Yeah, you can put your notes up there again, Dwight. Your screen. Thanks for doing that. So we ha and we also have these 300 years, which is a symbol for the message. Um, of so this movement. Yeah. would we say then symbolically that this situation with Jephthah is to be symbolically combined with the situation of Gideon? Oh, I yeah, because of the three hundred years and and other symbols that we had in the story of Gideon. Now, we know it's connected to the Sunday law, right? And we know the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law. Okay. So we have the type of the Sunday law. We have our lines, which is the first and second angel's messages, which are typified in Samuel Snow's letters. And this movement is a typification of that. And, and now we, when we go to Jephthah's tragic vow, I think in that context, we can understand what this vow is. Because this is the thing that's bothered me the most as I was looking ahead to Judges chapter 11.
So if you want to start start with this vow, we can maybe go back and see how this all fits. Okay, so the vow is what's bothered you the most? In that I didn't understand what it was. Okay. Right, because I could read through this and I could see where things were going. But I, I but when it came to this chapter to try to understand the message of Jephthah, where we would place it, and then where we would place Jephthah's vow, and also because there's sort of this um, implication and you know and what what that vow actually leads to and there are two different views on it so so i think it's an important part of the key to understanding this message of jephthah is understanding the vow it's also kind of interesting because when you when you look at this in the spirit of prophecy mrs white writes precious little on this portion of the bible right and specifically regarding jephthah yeah i mean she quotes the passage from hebrews chapter 11 with jephthah's name in it but that's it so you've got hebrews 11 i believe which they call the faith chapter yeah along with Judges 11. Mm -hmm. So the symbolism of the 11, one and one, is it not showing us our need for a one-to-one relationship with Christ? Well, it does, but I mean, you know, and we also have Daniel chapter 11 and Revelation chapter 11 and lots of different 11s I know. that happen. And of course, 11, 11. I mean, I was, I was born on uh, the 11th day of the 11th month on the biblical calendar. So I kind of note that myself. Okay. But, so- Yes. I'm sorry. This is I was just wanted um this this is what I my thoughts was on on that sacri- on that sacrifice. I was thinking that I was thinking that Jeffrey was um sacrificing the message for the church. You're saying the vow is the vow sacrificing the message. The vow, the vow. Well, not the vow. I'm talking about the, when he had to sacrifice his daughter. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. So. Okay. Well, I'm just stepping ahead. There's something that I've been thinking about, so I just thought I'd mention it. Yeah, and, and remember, we also have Genesis chapter 11, which is where the Tower of Babel occurs, and that's the law of first mention, I guess. Okay. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. Now the the, the translators seem to think that Jephthah seemed to have been judged only over northeast Israel. Well, the land of Gilead. Correct. Now, and Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then shall it be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. But in the Hebrew, if the translators have placed this correctly, the alternate Hebrew would say, then it shall be that which cometh forth shall come forth of my house to meet me. Is this not a doubling? 
Not in Hebrew. Not in Hebrew. Well, no, because no. they're not related words. Then how do you see this? Okay, so first off, um, then it shall be. So the interesting thing about this word is um, basically it means just to exist. It is, right? Um, and and we're going to see that word and when it says shall surely be the Lord's, right? That's that's the same Hebrew word. Uh, Strong's number is 1961. It's Hayah. And the word Lord or Jehovah's Yahaya, right? It it's basically just has a vav and vav in front of it. I am the Lord. Um, so so we have these uh, structures that you're going to see as we go through this. Now the word that's translated that whatsoever, um, I don't think is a very good translation of the word. Um, it's the word Asher which is really identical to the name Asher, which means blessed. But the reason why it means blessed is kind of a roundabout way. So um, it's, uh, and, and there's nothing in the Hebrew other than the vowel pointings that would distinguish it which are were added, you know, long after the time of Christ. Um, but basically, the way that if we were going to translate, and, and then you have the word yatsa, which is the one that cometh forth, of the doors, that's uh, from the doors, dalit is doors, um, of my house, by it. And, and then they're going to, so he's going to come from the door to meet me when I shall return. That's the word shuv. In peace, shalom, shalom, from the children of Ammon. So that's going to be Ben and Ben Ammon. And and that's where we get Ben Ami, you know, my people. So there is that children of, of Ammon. That's the connection there. Shall surely be the Lord's. Hayavahia. And I will offer up for a burnt offering. So this offering up and this burnt offering are, are Allah Ola. That's what it means. That's how you would say it in Hebrew. I will offer up. The word offer up is Allah. And the word burnt offering is Ola. So um, Okay. Now, from the chat. In verse 1129, that Gilead, being a hill or a heap of witness, was repeated three times. And then passed over also occurred three times in that same verse. And that was then compared with Isaiah 8 and Daniel 11. Is there anything sim significant or symbolic about these occurrences? Okay, so the Passover, the passing over is, is referencing um, Daniel. Going through Daniel 11 and Isaiah 8. Okay. So he passed over Gilead and Manasseh. He passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. Yeah, so it's just giving the track of his journey. So he went from Gilead to Manasseh. But what symbolism does that have for us? What message does it give us? Well, usually it would be three angels' messages. Okay. Right, if it's three times. But the passed over, you're connecting it to what what verse specifically? Isaiah 8, 7 and 8. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and might, many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over. I thought it was passed over all his banks 
and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even unto the neck and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Okay. That's Isaiah 8, 7, and 8. So, of course, you have an 8, 7, which is interesting, and a double 8. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're not related in Hebrew. Um, okay, just came to me. I thought it's interesting, you know, you have three, three times Passover, three yeah, times. Uh, um, well, because you got, well, you got different words. He shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. Now that word go over is, um, let's see here. Is is the same word as passed over. So that go over and passed over is the same. So those are related, though. But it's not uh, the other words aren't. So uh, so he shall pass through Judah is Kalaf. <coughs> he shall overflow. That's Shataf, and then go over a bar. So that's the one that's. Uh, so I mean we could relate it to there and then. Daniel chapter 11. What verse is in there? You're talking about the overflowing and passing through in 1110? Yeah, I think there's a second verse like that, though, right? In that same yeah. chapter? Yeah, but that one overflow is... Shataf, so it's it's kind of related to the other word, different spelling. But then the abar and pass through, then he shall return, which is shuv. Um, I mean these these are pretty common words in especially the word abar, because it it means all kinds of things. Um, Like if we use the word went. Um, so you're going to have the overflow and pass over in Daniel 11, verse 40. So... I mean, there might be a connection there. Now, um, do you have any thoughts on that, Dwight? Well, <clears throat> when we're dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south and the overflowing and Passover, yeah. there have been other symbols, other items that had been being applied that Elder Jeff had done. I just find it interesting with what was just brought up that we're looking at this again, first as a journey, but also in the symbolism how, as to how this relates to the messages of Revelation 14. Yeah, and to me, this would be a line. So, right, that's what's being described. Right, the agreed. The prophetic message, which would be this message of Jephthah. And we already know that it has a line, because that line's going to start, I mean, at least at November 9th, right? You're going to have November 9th, July 18th, uh, May 27th, you know, December 25th. We have this line dealing with the 777 structure. And... Um, so, so we have... We have a line described here that this message is in a line. The message of July 18th has its own line. Would we agree with that? I don't see a way we could disagree. Yeah. So now, so Jeff is going to pass over. He's going to begin at Gilead and then Manasseh. He passed over 
Gilead and Manasseh, and then passed over Mitzpah of Gilead, which is the watchtower. And then he passed over unto the children of Ammon. So he's gonna, we're going to have these three passed overs, which is a word, but very, very common word. It just means to basically go from one place to another, a transition. But we can see that that can relate to our lines. But then Jephthah vows a vow, right? That is, he promises a promise unto the Lord. So one's a verb, one's a noun. And said, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So when we get to this, there's a bunch of symbolism. One is, a lot of these are very common words that we attach to other prophecies. Okay. Right. So, I mean, we have that I will return, that shuv. I mean, it's a common word, but we also have shalom. Um, and, and then we have these doublings. He vows a vow in verse 30. And also he's offering it up as a burnt offering. Those two words are related. They both mean the same thing, to offer up something. And the word for a burnt offering are, are basically the same word. One is Allah and one is Ola, right? So it just has to do with the form of that word. And it means basically to, to ascend. So I will ascend an ascension is, is what's being talked about there. Now, the question is, why, why does Jephthah make this vow and what does it symbolize about the July 18, 2020 prediction? Why in the world would he say whatever comes out of my house? Like, were they keeping lambs and sheep and oxen and God alone knows what else, doves in their house? Yeah, he's thinking of the, well, when he talks about the house, it's not necessarily the building. How can you, how can you show that? Um, well, because the word house can meet, refer to the whole group of, of everything that a person possesses. Okay, so here. Yeah. If we were to take this and go to the verses that the translators would have used as supporting. Okay. We go to Leviticus 27. First, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. And thy estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old, even unto 60 years old. Even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. And then it was to continue from here. So would this vow, as, as we're pointing this out, if the person makes a vow, could they then redeem that of the vow for the number of shekels of the sanctuary? Um, no, I don't think that's talking about the same thing. So this is a vow. This is when, uh, I mean, my understanding of this, and I could be wrong, but this is just, uh, you're making a promise. There is a price for making a promise. But isn't that what Jephthah is doing here? He's making a singular vow. Yeah, but this is a very specific type of vow that's done in the sanctuary, right? So in no, Leviticus 27. I, I, how can you show that it is made in the sanctuary? Well, well, it's made in relationship to the sanctuary. It's something that's being promised to the sanctuary. It's an amount of money. Um, well, so these are these are things that people are. Um, I mean, these are a promise. This this is a promise. That's what a vow is: is a promise to God. 
and you make a promise to God, there is a price that you pay to the sanctuary for making a promise. But here again, <clears throat> when they when they came back, they also were comparing this mm -hmm. with the vow that Samson, or not Samson, but Samuel's mother had made. Right. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor upon his head. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, of course, we note First Samuel 128. Therefore, also, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Now, situation with this is Samuel's mother is basically committing him not just to the sanctuary, but if no razor was to come upon his head, is that also not part of the Nazarite vow? Yeah. Yeah, which, which I would agree. So in that situation, there's you're making a promise. So the idea is that what I get from Leviticus 26 is that when you make a vow, you don't just make a vow. You actually offer money to the sanctuary when you make a vow. That's that. I mean, well, on, on that point, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at, at Leviticus 27, not 26. I'm looking yeah. at 27 cursorily. I'm asking the question is, because we've, we've seen this in the past in other scripture verses. Okay. Where you could redeem a child or redeem a party with a certain monetary offering to this in in the sanctuary okay now in the case of samuel there was no monetary offering at that time because his mother was being specific Mm -hmm. That if she gave birth to a boy, that boy was going to be the Lord's all of the days of his life and would follow the Nazarite vow, which means he was not to drink. He was not to cut his hair. He was to be of the same type as Samson had been, but he was not given the strength, the physical strength of Samson, but he was given moral strength that Samson chose to set aside. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm asking the question about about this situation with this vow is it is it possible that Jephthah in making the vow was committing his daughter to the service of the Lord that I mean whatever came out of the house if it was an animal if it was a a clean animal would have been for a burnt offering. What if, what if what came out of his house was not considered as a clean animal? Would that have been acceptable as a burnt offering? Maybe he didn't... Uh have any unclean animals in this household.
okay maybe i'm maybe i'm being too modern but what if there was a dog or a cat I'm not disagreeing with you, Stephen, that maybe there were no unclean animals within his house, within his household. But it's interesting as we're going to get further into this, that it was his daughter that comes out first. I mean, what if it had been his wife? Yeah, well, we got to go back to Leviticus 27. So you're saying Leviticus 27 is talking about redeeming a vow if of a person how much you would pay. I'm asking the question, is that possible? And you're saying no, and I'm, I'm asking because I think it could be yes. Okay. Because this, this is something when a person makes a singular vow. They're dedicating something to the Lord right but it, this isn't talking about any redemption that I see uh, for making a vow there's just a cost for making a vow well okay if you look at Leviticus 27 11 and 12 because we'll I'll, I'll address it yeah, since it's the here. unclean beast the unclean beast yeah. Yeah. And if it be any unclean beast of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest. And the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as thou valuest it, who art the priest, so shall it be. And then so, it says, but if he will at all redeem it. Then he shall add a fifth part thereunto unto thy estimation. So a fifth part or 20%. Yeah, of the value. So one of the five wise virgins. Mm So, okay, so when you promise something to the Lord, right, because this is about promising something to the Lord, I guess, right? That's what we're saying. Correct. So you could promise land to the Lord. Um, but if you're not, if you're going to redeem that land, you're deciding you're not going to give that field. Um, it says here, um, okay, if it goes back, that starts at... Uh, verse 16, and if a man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of his field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. An omer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. And if he sanct sanctify his field from the year of Jubilee, according to the estimation, it shall stand. But if he sanctify his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain, even unto the year of the Jubilee, and it shall be abated from thy estimation. And if he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured to him. So this is talking about something promised to the Lord, and it can be redeemed. That is, even though you promised it, you can redeem it, but you have to add a fifth part of the value of it. Is that what it's saying? Well, I would think what we're going to need to do is to look at this a little bit more in depth. Yeah, I just don't. <laughs> okay, because you're wanting to look at this to decide what Jephthah does when he makes the vow. How he fulfills it, whether he sacrifices his daughter or not is that the concern here well no i i think that what we're going to find um 
I don't believe he sacrificed his daughter because human sacrifice was not something that the Lord permitted. But the daughter could have been committed to the Lord and could have then become a, a temple servant, basically. Now, the comment from the chat, could the daughter represent another message or the vindication of a message that had been given and rejected by many? A renewal of a vow to the Lord to continue in one's calling. Hmm. Now, we're coming to the end of our time together today. I think if we were to take this up again tomorrow, after we have read through Leviticus 27 individually, then we might be able to, to finish this conversation and proceed in what we're finding here in Judges 11. Okay. Now, do we have any other questions or comments at this time? All right. Shall we then close in prayer? Father in heaven, we've come to a point that we do not fully understand. We ask, Father, for your wisdom and for your guidance. We ask you to direct us in our study. Help us so that we may more prepare for future study and be guided by you in the path that you would have us to walk. Help us now, Father, direct us so that we may more properly represent your character in all that you would have us to do. Be with us through this day so that your name and your character may be glorified. For this, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.